um, I know you talk, you've talked to a lot of people uh, over the last few years, Melissa. Um, one thing I was wondering, right, um, and um, maybe you can help people kind of understand how, how you've gone about making this film, the journey that it's taken to get to the final product. Now, just to put it out there, you were working with some amazing stock footage, right? Amazing archival footage, right? So whenever you have, it's almost like you're doing, uh, what's the, uh, the last dance for Michael Jordan? You got all this footage, oh my gosh. <laughs> Um, and then obviously, uh, the interviews that, you know, made Nick Ashford and Mary Baraka seem like they were still here. You know what I mean? <laughs> like it, it was, I mean, I mean, so I mean, you know that this had to happen over a period of time to get to that final piece. Could you maybe just talk a little bit about the process? Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. First of all, so exciting <laughs> to be able to screen the film at your film festival in Newark. Shout out to Newark and all our folks there. Um, it was really important for us to tell the story of Soul, but to also tell the story of Ellis Hayslip because he was so unique. And the show was on PBS from 1968 to 1973. And even though he lived a, a long life, we just wanted to drop in on those five years. So to tell the story of the man and also the story of the show at the same time. And then we had to bring in the story of what was happening in the nation and how a show like Soul could interrupt television and what we were used to seeing. So it was really like three stories in one. Yes. And we knew that we had the full archive of the show. So it was 130 episodes over a period of five years. So that was a lot of material to look at. And then to look at those five years of Ellis Hazelp's life and how, they, how his personality, as you guys were saying, was, was integral to the, the way the show was created and how he brought all his friends together, really. Not just colleagues and artists, but people that he had communion with, people that he believed in, um, and people he played cards with late at night. You know, Soul was like a family. And right. so our, my idea for the film was, how can we create this love letter to black culture and also make people fall in love with Ellis if they don't know him? You know, we had to recognize that this was a very specific period of time and some people might be familiar with the film, uh, with, the, with the episodes of the show of Soul itself, but many people were learning it for the first time. So we wanted to be inclusive and make it a story that was universal, but also uh, really gratifying uh, for, for black people especially because he made the show for us. He right. made Soul for us by us. And to be able to see that now is really significant to be able to look back and see the revolution that he started on television and how he was such a trailblazer for diversity and inclusion and all the things that are like hot button topics right now. He was already thinking about that back then, but really he just wanted to show the full range of the black experience on television, which hadn't been seen before at that moment because it was 1968. Um, I wish there was something kind of like it out right now. It's kind of like it, you know? It seems like, I was talking to my mother earlier, uh, the era of uh, the black arts movement and, and the radical black uh, and Afro and the strength. Oh, I was asking earlier, what happened after 73? Because not only did it seem like um, that show was taken off the air, but it's, I wasn't alive until 76 now, but it just seemed from what I know of history, the pop book became popular just to start to become more of a, I don't know, dance, entertainment, the loss of the Afro, the pickup of, you know, a Jerry Curl, even, um, you know, that black arts movement, how, you know, there was an entertaining quality to it, but it was, it wasn't sugarcoated. You didn't have to, you know, it, it wasn't paraphrased. You didn't have to like look for the hidden message that it was in your face, educational and thought provoking. And that was the truth about our lives, right? Black people live out loud. We don't need to apologize. And that was really important that Ellis wanted to show that we could be unapologetically black, that we had a love affair with our blackness. This was a complete counter narrative to what you were seeing on TV, which was just the riots and poverty and, and what the other gays wanted to you know, depict of us. And Ellis said, no, I'm gonna show you the true mirror to the black experience. We have a renaissance happening here. We have artists and politicians and 
We can talk about love, black love, black strength, black sister and brotherhood, black agreement, black descent, black poetry being, you know, the, the expression of the people. Right. And all of this was relevant. We could disagree and we could agree, but let's show the full mirror of the black experience. And that's what was so revolutionary about soul that you could have a show that was just dedicated to poets or you could have you know earth wind and fire doing a a a full set for the whole episode maybe you have a poet like nikki giovanni interviewing james baldwin and then turn around and have you know curtis mayfield not just singing with the impressions but actually sitting down and having an important conversation you didn't get to hear conversations between artists you know maybe you'd hear them on the radio maybe you get to see them at the apollo but the idea that there was this black performance experience that was a true definition of who we are and who we were to put that on television and bring that into people's living rooms Mm -hmm. that that was dope (laughs) but it was also it was real you know and he wasn't looking for a fake you know nobody was fronting nobody was flossing it just was it was very sincere undiluted unapologetically black and um you know i think about the, the pbs and i guess coming up it was just like oh pbs is boring it's the boring channel you know you get reading rainbow you know i guess that, that was on pbs when i was coming up and it definitely wasn't soul you know <laughs> you know Le- var burton was was great and everything but it was like it wasn't soul so but when i say that man PBS was like the livest show for a number of years with Soul. And PBS had a, I have a to, like a total different focus now on PBS. And remember, that was the beginning of PBS. So was it? He oh. had the he had the advantage of the the Public Broadcasting Act of nineteen sixty nine is what created the public broadcasting system, PBS, a system of stations around the country. Mm-hmm. And that was a brand new concept. And because it was funded and it was nonprofit, you didn't right. have, you know, um, there was no seven second delay. You could do whatever you wanted. There was no, right. <laughs> you know, anything could happen. And I think Ellis knew that. And so mm-hmm. he took advantage of that moment that everything was uncensored, that there was, there was, you didn't have to answer to a sponsor like for commercial breaks. So he said, I'm just gonna do this until I get stopped. <laughs> Right. Wow. And that was the beginning of PBS, this idea of for the people, by the people, and really bringing, you know, that's where black media started, really Mm -hmm. important. And they had what they call public affairs shows, like Say Brother or Like It Is with Gil Noble. But Ellis took the idea of a public affairs show and and pushed it even further so that he could push the culture forward and say, black culture is culture, you know? Mm -hmm. That was really important. Even when they did try to make an effort uh, to put spoken word back out there in some kind of syndication through the Deaf Jam or Deaf Poet Jam. Deaf Poetry Jam, yeah. Poetry Jam. That was the, that's, that, when that was out, that's the only thing that I've seen, I guess, in my lifetime where they would try to put, put spoken word on, on, on stage. And there's a but, direct connection there because that was Stan Lathan who right. directed Deaf Poetry Jam. And, Stan came from Seoul. He was the original director of Seoul and he learned how to be a director on Seoul. And so he took all those influences of the black arts movement, of the poets, Nikki Giovanni, Sonia Sanchez, Amiri Baraka, and and brought that energy into the future with Deaf Poetry Jam. Now, the only thing I was gonna say is that, and I, and I, I kind of knew that, I was just gonna throw it out there, but hey, he put together, uh, Stan Lee put that together. But the only thing I was gonna say is, man, I wish he had a, connected fully with that soul format, not just made it like just spoken word. You know what I mean? Had it like that same set of a spoken word and, and dance and, 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 and uh, political yeah. debate and, you know, yeah, I think the, the, thing is that, um, the biggest soul sensation can, you know, or whatever can all be part of that form. Cause that format is just so like funky. <laughs> yeah, and it's really unique too. And it's really unique to the time. Yeah. And I think we have to remember that as time changed and the motivations of media and, and representation and also, um, you know, television, what television was trying to do and, and how everything was changing, that took a different turn. And so 
suddenly they were answering to sponsors and answering to mu mu many more options on television to watch. So when Soul came on, there were very few options. There was just ABC, P CBS, and NBC. Right. And then you had PBS, which is like the UHF channel, if you're lucky. And so that the, as everything kind of advanced, like, where got it shut down. They could control those other imagery and the narrative yeah. on those other three main channels. But the PBS yeah. is like, oh, really? He's going to do whatever they want? And no, no, mix that, right? <laughs> I hear you. Well, I mean, this is, this is a lot of great information. Your film is excellent. Uh, Thank you so much for having me. And I'm so excited to be able to bring this film to Newark. It's so important, you know, um, with Naras Baraka as mayor. And of course, just this relationship that you could see very clearly that he called him Imamu. Amiri Baraka was called Imamu by Alice Hazel And it's so beautiful that we were able to interview him. We interviewed him in May of 2013. And we know that he joined the ancestors in January of 2014. So this film is also like a, almost like a time capsule, as you were saying, all the people that we were able to interview and all of our kind of all stars of black culture. And it's right. so important to lift our, lift up our people, you know, and this film is not just entertaining and informational, but it's uplifting and it's, it's ours. And that was our whole goal in making it was to, take something so important as soul and to give it back to the people.